everyone. Welcome to a Project Geospatial webinar on real-time Earth observation. I'm delighted to have a panel of experts here to discuss uh, how things are changing in Earth observation and what real-time uh, data delivery could mean for this field. My guests today are Robert Cardillo, president of the Cardillo Group and former director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and Marcy Stenke, a retired U.S. Air Force colonel and combat pilot. Marcy was Maxar Technologies Vice President for Government Relations, and prior to that she worked in the White House Operations Directorate. Uh, Dan Nevius of Analytical Space, co-founder and CEO of the company. Prior to that, he directed special projects at Planetary Resources. And Gabe Dominoc let's see. Dominocello. And Gabe oh. Dominocello, Umbra Lab co-founder. So welcome everyone. Um, perhaps we could get started by talking about the latest news, which was the commercial remote sensing regulations that just came out a few days ago. And Robert, I'd be interested in any thoughts you have about this new direction. So thanks, Deborah, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, friends and colleagues to have this um, uh, important conversation. Um, I am quite enthused uh, about the recently released uh, update to the licensing procedures. I have a good 20 plus years of experience in this uh, realm. Um, I have um, experienced the ups and downs, if you will, of uh, that process, um, albeit almost all of those 20 years, except the last one being from the government side. And, you know, it's, uh, as most people know, it's an interesting balance that we try to find with those procedures. Um, uh, we know it's in our country's and our economy's interest to have a vibrant, innovative, um, um, commercial imaging community. And we have a second thought. This is the we being the government in the back of our head going, um, gee, uh, if they get too good, and that's always in the eye of the beholder, there's risks associated with that too good part. And so around that kind of tension that exists between economic vitality and innovation and entrepreneurial um, uh, capital, et cetera, has been this issue of risk and security. What I like about the new uh, proposals is I think it shifts um, some of the onus that used to almost all be on the companies you almost had to prove your innocence, you know, in front of a pretty demanding jury. And now uh, it's not that it's, you know, gone switched completely to the other side. I think it's a more um, equitable playing field where if the government has an objection or if there's a concern, they obviously have the wherewithal to state those, but it, it too must be proved out. You know, it can't, can't just stay at the assertion phase. So, I'll leave it at there for now. I know we'll talk about it further, but I, I just, I like the shift. Um, and and my, my hope is that it will enable us to achieve that, you know, vibrant, um, innovative, uh, technology-driven uh, advancement that, that I know this, this country and, this, and, and our companies have within them. And I look forward to seeing that become more prevalent for both for uh, consumers and for the government. Marcy, do you have any comments on the new rules? I know you've worked on these extensively. I do. I, I agree with Robert. Very, very happy to see this. It's, a, I would say, a long time coming, but um, happy that uh, happy that they got there. And obviously, the devils are in, devils in the details. But I highly commend Secretary Ross, Kevin O'Connell, and the team for taking on a pretty big challenge. And um, this is a seemingly fairly significant shift in, in how this is being looked at. So while with my background of 
just shy of 26 years in the government. And then in the last eight plus national security has always been, you know, critical concern. And so I'm glad that although they're keeping that as a obviously important concern, there's some common sense being employed now. And so um, hopefully this will um, ease the burden, hopefully on both sides, because there was a lot of requirements on the government side as well, the way it was structured. And so uh, hopefully it puts a focus on the important um, oversights without being so comprehensively burdensome to both sides at this point. So I think that it's going to lead to um, an easier maintenance of global leadership from an industry and a, um, perspective as well. So I look forward to it. When you say common sense, do you mean the comparison with other nations and their abilities to obtain similar data? The, you know, there's there's a initial or before there was an interagency process that had a variety of people from different um, Department of Defense and intelligence community um, entities that all had something to say about it. And rightfully so, they all looked at it from their very specific, strong perspective. Um, the problem is that created a lot of um, very slow process. Um, and so it wasn't helpful for industry. Therefore, it's not helpful for the nation because you've got U.S. companies who were waylaid. And yes, not necessarily having to follow or having to follow um, regulatory burdens that internationally countries don't need to follow. So um, obviously they got the point if you read the preambles and, and the point is it doesn't help constrain U.S. companies when the rest of the world is, is um, marching forward. So that's the general process or the general thought process here. Gabe and Dan, anything you wanted to say about these regulations? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like to add, I mean, we had a satellite, or we have a satellite that we've been building for three years that our exquisite products were not available for sale outside of the U.S. government. So this is a total game changer for us. It's enabling us to sell really exquisite products commercially um, which, you know, we didn't, we weren't entirely certain we were going to be able to do. Um, so I couldn't be more ecstatic. And as the Europeans catch up, you know, we're going to get, we're going to be able to offer really, really exquisite things, like very cool things uh, to the commercial sector. And for us, we're, we're almost one step removed as focusing more on the data transport piece of it. So we don't have any sensors on our satellites. It's more moving data off of those platforms or being able to communicate to task them uh, with lower latency. But for us, we I think there's a big opportunity in the next decade for us to move forward kind of in a combination of these new regulations and, and changes that open up possibilities. And also as we add the infrastructure that allows us to reduce latencies, then we can get to a point where applications are no longer limited by connectivity or regulation, and it really only becomes limited by our imaginations, what we can build on top of these capabilities. So I think the combo of those two, reducing latencies, adding more sensors to the mix, plus opening up this ability to, uh, to move quicker with less regulation and really expanding the, the markets that, that people like Gabe can sell into, will have a really interesting effect on uh, what we can do as an industry. Yeah, I think there'll be a real hockey stick effect on the commercial market, particularly on the GeoInt side. If you enable these sensors to do really cool things, guys like Dan are going to make more money. Guys at uh, your, whoever, your Descartes, your Orbital Insights, your Ursas, they're all going to make more money. And it, it's just a really positive thing for the United States. So Dan brought up latency. And so why is um, latency important? Why do we need real-time Earth observation? Robert, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. I spent a good portion of my life uh, trying to at least uh, approach real-time because the customers that I was serving for most of my career were either in a muddy uniform or, you know, a plywood uh, forward operating base. And, you know, the closer you got to real time, the more secure you made them 
or the greater uh, chance they had for operational success. And, and the reason is age old. Um, you know, when you're, when you're surveying the horizon and you're trying to identify risks or opportunities, um, any delay is potentially harmful. Because if it's, a, if it's a risk, if it's a threat, that delay could cause the threat to be realized before you have the opportunity to act. An act could be a movement, it could be a counteraction, it could be you know, a, a, a new decision. So, you know, this is this is the holy grail. Uh, this being as close to real time. Uh, what it really excites me, though, Deborah, is that what it enables on that opportunity side. I mean, obviously, we'll always keep risks in mind. But the more that you're able to bring to a decision maker information of of interest that creates decision space. They can act sooner. And, you know, I mean, because we're all at home right now, because of, you know, a, a global reality, um, we all know, too, that delay costs, in this case, you know, it has health effects, it has economic effects, it has emotional effects. And, um, and again, I'm not trying to rewrite history, but but one could imagine that that had the globe had a better understanding sooner of what it was facing, it would have made better decisions. So, I'm sorry to go from a from the foxhole to you know the planet's health and well-being, but I do think it is in in fact both of those ranges are 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 viable with respect to real time, and 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 thus its criticality. Mm-hmm. Who else wants to chime in on the importance of real time? I can add a bit to that. Um, so for us, Robert covered really well the defense kind of national security aspects. Um, and we always are trying to map out what are the different applications that really require low latency. And we have had a lot of traction on the, the defense side. We have some contracts with the Air Force now to explore some of those applications. Um, but on the commercial side as well, there are applications um, kind of across the board a mix of ones that really value that information coming in quickly, where there's an expiration date. If you think about financial intelligence, if I understand what's going on in the world faster than somebody else, I can take action on that and, and have a better chance for my investment. Um, and then others are just less sensitive to the timing of it, but can benefit from the added just volume of data. And that's that's another element that is a secondary effect of this. If we can get to real-time downlink off of these remote sensing platforms, it not only gives you more actionable intelligence, but it also opens up the possibility for just a higher volume, right? Because right now these satellites are waiting to physically fly over a ground terminal. The Earth is 70% water, so there's this huge gap where they just can't be offloading data. And so if you have that real-time connectivity over those oceans, that's just also extra time you can just be offloading non-time sensitive data as well. And so as people are looking at precision agriculture, maybe applying hyperspectral information to that, that's almost something you get for free if you can get to real-time um, infrastructure as well. So it has an effect across the board, not only for time sensitive, but also these ripple effects where higher volumes of data maybe drive down the cost per image that then open up new applications from that perspective as well, where maybe the cost was a barrier to applying it to a specific sector. So it's it all fits together that that infrastructure can play multiple ro- roles and have multiple impacts on the commercial side of the industry as well. From the defense side, uh, real time with resolution that's military usable is I, I think a game changer um, from an intelligence or predictability. And then I've talked to some friends that are in positions that think that talk about attribution being really key to and a high value to the warfighter. Um, it's funny that Robert uses the age old um, phraseology because from a from an aviation or perspective that that competition, whether it's in the commercial sector or combat operations, and Dan alluded to it too, that timely and actionable information is key. So, you know, timely allows a decision maker to make a decision in a much more um, a used, 
full time frame. An actual is it's trusted, it's high quality, and so you know that that decision that you're making is valid. So, I think also um, from an ER or excuse me, an EO versus a SAR. I think the SAR is also from an Umbra um, perspective that SAR is also um, somewhat easier in some of this because that pattern recognition is possibly easier on the SAR side, not being a technical expert. I'm not quite sure about that, but it's interesting how the switch has gone in the really the eight years or nine years that I've been playing in Robert's world here that, um, that initially the conversation was very much about pixels. And then then it was, there are so many pixels, what do you do with that information? And so now it's the derived information and the usability of that. And so obviously you pull in artificial intelligence and machine learning to that. Um, but I think you also look at um, sensor to shooter or sensor to sensor as opposed to sending the information to the back lot, doing some processing there and then sending it back. It is more um, moving the process to the edge and that downlink or that direct downlink will help with that as well. And I think that on the commercial perspective, if you think about a scenario like a hurricane, like being able to image an area before the hurricane hits, so, you know, radar can see through clouds, right? So you image an area before the hurricane hits, you know, which areas are going to flood, you know, what would happen to a crop, uh, that sort of thing. And then you image it afterwards. That all needs to be done very, very quickly. And if your satellite's not over a ground station, then you wouldn't get those images. And think about where that works downstream. You got the hedge fund guy who can trade on it. You got the insurance company who's looking at um, what happens with the policies. You got the people making sure that they're safe. You got to have make sure FEMA can get in there. And it's so there's untold commercial applications that people haven't really been thinking about because it hasn't been possible. One, because of the snow regulation, having having these this kind of imagery at 25 centimeters and below, it's wild. And then on top of that, what Dan's doing, getting the data down immediately is a total game changer. So, you know, I think it's just, this is a, a really great time to be in commercial remote sensing. Um, so Robert, there was, you, um, oh, sorry, Dan. To that, there was an interesting, sorry, I was just going to, Add that there is Looking Valley Bank came out with recently where they were um, talking about the GPS playbook and talking about how this space based infrastructure created this space derived signal that then all of these applications were built on top of. And they were trying to map out how much economic value has been created on top of that capability and then trying to compare that to um, some of these trends we're seeing now. And it's a very similar um, dynamic where. Once you have this capability, then it's just you're you're limited only by your imagination in terms of what you can build on top of that. And a lot of the applications that we saw come off of GPS, like location-based services, kind of the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, wouldn't be possible without that fundamental infrastructure. I think we'll see a similar dynamic with remote sensing, especially as we decrease the cost to improve the quality and actionableness of this data. And so a lot of these applications we, we may not even have on our radar yet, um, but could create billions and trillions of economic value in the future on top of these base capabilities. I feel like we've been more reliant on earth imagery than ever before during this pandemic. There's so little travel and I've been so interested to see what I could learn from imagery of the world. Um, but Robert, you seem to be alluding to failures in this area. Oh, um, I mean, I'll, I'll make a, what I don't think is a bold statement, but I'm happy to have people take other views. This is a global systemic failure, period. We, you know, we, I don't know, what are there, 218 countries, you know, on the, on the planet? Um, every one of them is a unique, you know, kind of compact between the governed and, and the government, right? That's been that way for a millennium. Um, but one of the central tenets of all of those compacts is keep me safe, right? I, I, I'm going to either give you money or time or some exchange of value. And what I get back for it is I get to sleep at night without fear. Uh, every nation has failed. Um, uh, now, now, 
I guess I'm comfortable saying that because of the outcome. The outcome that we now have medical trauma, financial uh, you know, uh, effects, uh, emotional, societal, the, to me, because the you know, governments writ large um, um, didn't do their side of the compact, it's a failure. But back to this conversation, um, to me, you know, the, look, there's overriding medical and health and science now endeavors to combat uh, the virus, and, you know, whether it's pursuit of treatments or, or a vaccine. Underneath that, though, um, are fundamentally where questions. Where's the virus? Where's the medical capacity to treat those that are affected? And oh, by the way, where's the supply train that's supporting that medical capacity? And where's the population that's not affected, infected today? And how do we protect them? And, and again, there's, there's tons of other interesting questions, but to your point, Deborah, understanding the answers to those where questions, quite frankly, is is being fed by my other three colleagues on this call, um, you know, to give us the potential to answer those questions. And, and um, again, I, I'm with Dan. I, I think, I think it, it's harder to think about where the, those answers would not be useful in our society than to try to list all the ones that would be. Uh, it seems uh, limitless to me. Marcy, did you have something to add? Yes. Forgive the helicopter going overboard right now. Ah, ospreys, two of them, very fun. Uh, the mechanical kind, not the winged version. Uh, I've been looking at it, in, uh, honestly, through the Maxar lens because I've been looking at some of the things that they've been doing and, and I'm sure it's applicable with other companies. Um, to some extent as well. But there's been a number of things that they've been able to do um, in leveraging geodata for COVID response. And um, they've been opening up um, different mapping and different data insights for folks, for first responders and other um, nonprofit folks to be able to use. Um, they've opened up, like there's a certain number of things obviously that are used for modeling pandemics, like travel, whether it's air or commuting, logistics, infrastructure, public health, poor socioeconomic conditions, those kinds of things. And so they've opened that up so folks can use, I'm sure for predictive capabilities. I know um, one of the things that's been beneficial more so on the government side, but the known program with NGA um, is allowing a lot of the folks for NGA to work at home and still be able to use the information. So do um, to provide their, um, not only the automated tools, but the human expertise and improve the volume and the quality of the mapping that's being done in these trying times right now. Um, uh, I think, um, I know, and, and then you could even look at, you talked about typhoons or hurricanes, those kinds of things. I mean, just recently there was, I believe the name is Typhon, Typhoon Vong Fong um, that, that they were, it was used for, um, in addition to, you know, other companies using it for insurance aids and, and Gabe's already alluded to that, so I won't belittle it. But I know that, that with that open data release that's been done, there's um, community directed, um, capabilities that are being done or they they allow the integration with workflows of companies like Rubicon and and folks that are trying to get in to help folks that, that need it in different areas and so um, there's definitely benefits and I, I feel like um, particularly with the, the legislative changes that have just made um, I mean there's obviously been great growth in in geolocation already, but I think that it will grow. I mean, you think about the, the things that opened up when GPS became much more available. I feel like we're kind of in the cusp of another scenario like that. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see where we are in, you know, three to five years and how things may have changed. Yes. Yeah, so, so one of the things that is changing is startups like analytical space and Umbra Lab. Um, it seems like the pandemic is showing the importance of earth observation and yet 
it's it also seems like it could be a challenging time if you need to raise money um, during this period. So how are startups faring? I can start off. So we raised money for to launch our satellites before the pandemics. We're very lucky. Um, I think that the biggest difference is because we invented something new, right? We invented a, an antenna that opens up in a novel way. Um, a lot of the government folks are not familiar with it. So we would typically do like pretty frequent tours of different people um, just to kind of like show me we want to understand that. And we're not doing that. And, and I'm looking at the greater earth observation community in terms of like, you, you, you it's, it's shrinking. I, I think that, but I think it's a health, it's a bit of a healthy shrinking. Think of it like there was a lot of money pushed out. Um, but some of the guys who were on the edge were like, Oh, well, I don't really know. Um, those guys I imagine are probably having trouble. Seems seems to me that it's very highly variable, depending on your state coming into the pandemic. Like companies like like Gabe, for example, um, have good timing with the fundraise, right? So if you just raised money, you can maybe weather the storm, even if some of your customers have disappeared. If you have more of a commercial focus instead of a government focus, um, but there will be, I think, some very strong companies that just have bad timing, where they were just on the edge of doing their next fundraising, VCs kind of roll back their interest to see how things play out or focus more on their existing uh, portfolio companies. And then if they had more of a commercial focus, say serving like airlines and cruise ships, right, then that's kind of a, a hard thing to, to work through, even though the underlying technology and, and business is strong. Um, so a lot of it is highly variable. And then there's also the question on supply chain, how does this affect launch cadence? Um, I think we'll see some company deaths in the early term just because they are almost out of cash and they can't fundraise. But then in the longer term, it's it's often the case that in order to hit that next milestone to raise that next round, sometimes a launch is that key milestone. And so if launches get systematically pushed back three, six, 12 months, you may just have companies kind of dying on the vine because they can't hit that milestone and they just run out of cash in that process. And so there's, we're, we're looking at everything from a supply chain risk as well. We, we were kind of somewhat lucky in that from a timing for us, we're in between satellites. So a lot of the work that we're doing now is design phase. And so we don't have any hardware really in the building at the moment to try to figure out how do you build it standing six feet apart. Um, but we were coming up on, we just uh, got awarded a major Air Force contract that we're trying to line up our Series A with. And so we're also lucky in the sense that a lot of our work today is with uh, the Air Force, which is a nice, reliable source of, of revenue, and we can continue to hit those milestones. And so it's really been a case of how do you figure out how to first survive, make sure you have enough cash to get through kind of this tumultuous period. But then how do you think through it? We do have some tailwinds in the remote sensing industry. So how do we actually take advantage of this increased interest in geospatial or increased willingness to try out new things as the whole world's kind of gotten shaken up and kind of necessity is the mother of invention. So it's a, an interesting balance between those two things. And I think it'll be highly variable across all the different startups, across all the different segments of the space industry. Yeah, it, it is an interesting time, especially when you couple it with the new uh, regulatory environment. And I know, I remember for years, Maxar talked about shortwave infrared and desperately wanted the ability to sell that. Um, so it looks like we have that now. Am I interpreting that correctly? I'd say so. I mean, I, I, I would like to reread that section, but yeah, it's definitely opened up a little bit more. I had uh, one question that I was going to ask the company, but... Um, but it's definitely going in the right direction. So yes. Yeah. Um, Robert, anything else you wanted to say about these new regulations and um, do we not really know something yet? Do we need to see the details or is it all out there already? Oh, there's plenty we need to know. I mean, it's, it's words on, on a piece of paper now. Now people need to execute both the government and, and new licensee requesters. Um, 
But the reason I'm confident, um, and, and look, I'm sure we're going to run a, wow, we didn't mean that to happen with those words. And why is it now getting stuck over here? We'll find out new problems. I'm not, I'm not oblivious to that reality. The reason why I'm optimistic, uh, Deborah, is I know the intent behind the new regulations. Um, I've known Kevin O'Connell for more than 20 years now. The man literally wrote the book. Uh, there's a book uh, on the commercial imagery market from the 90s, okay, that that Kevin has been on this, you know, release uh, the power of, uh, <laughs> of U.S. commercial industry for 20 years. And we couldn't, the country couldn't be better served right now than Kevin. And obviously, um, you know, Secretary Ross has got kind of a single-minded focus to get out of the way of American business, right? To, you know, draw down regulation, you know, where it can be, uh, you know, again, that balance between, you know, government protection and industry innovation, that tension's there. But, and let's face it, um, as the government grapples with the reality of our economic situation, they're trying to find areas to further get out of the way um, right now. And, um, and uh, so I, I think that's, I think that's going to be, I, I'm highly confident that's going to have a positive outcome. On the defense side, uh, we'll see. Uh, again, uh, I, I like the shift from, you know, young company A, prove to me that you'll do no harm in the next whatever number of years and the following spectral ranges and all that. And that's hard to do. You know, you can't, you can't prove a negative. Um, now, as I read the regulations, the defense can bring in an objection or, you know, some sort of, you know, limiting factor to the technology but it has to be with a reason and the, and the reason now has a clock on it. Yeah. So, okay, we'll give you three months or six months of whatever protection, but you got to come back and renew that to show it that, you know, it's still viable. So again, I, I think that's a good step forward. Um, uh, it'll still, there'll still be tension in the system. There's supposed to be, there'll still be unintended outcomes at time, but, uh, what excites me is I think this is going to, you know, liberate and and you know unleash the kind of uh, innovation that we've got on this call today. The the thing I think is a really positive um, pivot might be the right word is when we got resolution relief years ago. As you remember, Robert, you were key in that. Um, part of the verbiage in that was that the government would also have to start looking at how they can, they conducted their operations and adjust to a changing world. And it was probably about a year ago, I asked, where are you guys in those adjustments? And have you even taken one step forward in adjusting to the new world? And, and someone mentioned, well, we may have moved the big toe, but that's about it. And so this really is a bit of a forcing function, I'd say, to make them think through things a little bit more expeditiously and how to change the way they operate. Um, obviously, force protection's critical, um, but they need to start looking at it because it's not just U.S. companies that are um, a challenge right now. So. Yeah, um, and I wonder if this might help with investment in startups as they have more of an open playing field to sell the innovative products they're coming up with. I think it's a big deal. Uh, I really do. I mean, if, if you think about it, you know, back to American ingenuity, right? You know, we, you know, we, we landed a man on the moon. This is, this is the greatest country on earth and entrepreneurship has allowed all of that. I mean, it was, you know, Lockheed Martin was working on the different parts of the, the space shuttle. It's the, if you allow startups and more, and the core of all this is how do you generate revenue and grow economies of scale? And if you're limited by regulation and you're looking at the Chinese, Russians, uh, you know, all, the Europeans all building huge fleets of different kinds of spacecraft that are competitive with the U.S. and you're putting the chains on American ingenuity, it's probably not a great policy. 
So I, I couldn't be happier about the change in regulation. And I think that, you know, always, you know, for us specifically, like I said, we had a satellite with a capability that was way beyond the regulation, right? And so that would always, it, it would always come up with um, our investors and it would come up with competitors. Competitors would be like, oh, those Umbra guys, they can't even sell what they're doing. But now it's like, well, we, we, we still kind of probably have a, a, a small limitation, but we definitely can do much better than we could have a few days ago. I think just to add to that, it's, I think the shift is bigger than just the regulatory policy as well. Like we've noticed, not only is it becoming easier to, to get through that regulatory process, but I've also noticed an embrace from the government in general in terms of adopting these commercial solutions. Like we've been a huge, um, we've had a, a lot of benefit from the AFWERTS program in the Air Force, kind of them trying to allow you to come knock on the front door of the Air Force and then have a process to become a program of record as, as a space startup. And I think it's really a response to some of these evolving geopolitical tensions, right? Where they realize that the US DOD needs to speed up that innovation cycle, really take advantage of a lot of this investment coming from the private side. They, they keep quoting kind of this figure where they said that historically, the amount of money that went into space R&D came from the government, but that's dramatically shifted where now it's 20% from the DOD, 80% from the private markets. And so they're realizing how that shift has happened, the need for that increased pace um, to mitigate some of these evolving threats. And so they've really shifted um, their approach and a lot of their culture to how do we start embracing these startups? How do we make sure that we can uh, use their solutions faster? And that's really had a huge impact on us in particular, and I think across the industry, especially when it pertains to going out to raise private capital. If the government's put, a, put their faith in you and given you a contract to move forward, that's a large customer. It validates that there's some value in what you're doing. And you're also seeing it on the NASA side with a lot of these uh, commercial programs, starting with commercial crew and cargo, and kind of off the, the momentum of that, moving now into the Artemis program with the Eclipse missions on the robotic landers and then the human lunar landers with their most recent awards. So it's, it's a huge tailwind on the government side as well, where it's really great that they're starting to embrace the, the commercial industry as part of their core strategy on how to move quickly um, to, to solve for some of the challenges that they're facing uh, over the next couple of years. The pandemic just kind of complicates all that, but uh, I think those will persist and maybe even be stronger as they start to think about how do we now pay back off these, these trillions of dollars we just added to the national debt? How do you do more as the DOD or NASA with less resources because those resources have gone elsewhere? So I think the outcome of that will be really fascinating to see play out over the next five to 10 years as, as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully, and then kind of enter this new dynamic. Look, can I build on that, Deborah? Um, first, it, at the end, Dan, it's got to be sooner than five or 10 years. Yeah. It has to be. Uh, the world demands it. Uh, we, we owe it uh, to ourselves and to our citizens. Um, Two, though, Deborah, I wanted to come back to your point. I, I think, yeah, there's a certain amount of, you know, technical parameters to this and, you know, regulatory specifics. Uh, to me, the much bigger change that makes me optimistic is mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I am old enough uh, to remember the, I'll say the good old days, when we created advantages as a, com as a country and especially as a government by having technology no one else had and having access to space that no one else had. And, and, and that's a long time ago, but I, I would tell you those were great days because it was truly a discriminating advantage and we could see things no one else could see, we could know them sooner. And so, you know, what's wrong with that? And, and while intellectually, I know my peers in government know that, has all changed. I mean, they know it. They do. They're not. They're not blind. But that muscle memory is hard to change because mm -hmm. you were raised a certain way. That oh, we got to protect. We got to protect. And yes, we have to protect. And we have to find new ways to advantage. And let's face it. That's that's life, right? You know, coffee shop A wants to sell more coffee than coffee shop B. You know, and they try to figure out how do I do that. And, 
and they have all these different ideas about how to do that. And, and, and you know, government A would like to know a little bit more than government B so that they can trade more efficiently or build more economically, et cetera, et cetera, or position militaries in a more secure way. There's lots of, you know, answers depending on that awareness, but what in, and, you know, Dan mentioned it, you know, we need more Will Ropers, we need more Hondo Gertzes, we need more people that are ready to say, you know what, the world has changed and our government needs to change with it uh, so that it can take the advantage of, uh, of the new idea. And, and to me, I think that, that that momentum is only going to build with these regs um, and new licensing procedures. And so I think that momentum will continue to grow. The number of man hours that will be saved by companies with this reg is enormous. Just the number of hours that were spent trying to explain or have a conversation about why something was the way it was. Um, I mean, just from that perspective, it's an immense change, but you're right. I agree, Robert, the culture shift is, is critical. Well, I think there's one more thing and it's, and this is really important for like Mike and Dan. If you look at Space Force and how the government is trying to create a resilient uh, architecture in space, you can't use billion dollar satellites. You have to get as much as you can out of, you know, low cost satellites that have either in my case really high quality or in Dan's case um, really great downlink. So uh, there, there was another panel we were asked like how do you manage size, weight, and power? And the answer is innovation. Like we innovated and, and built something new, this you know antenna that opens up in a really novel way. And it allowed us to skirt a lot of the heat issues that were plaguing radar startups with, with, with these kind of smaller um, platforms. So if you let the entrepreneur innovate, it is only going to possibly benefit the United States government. And Dan's a great example, like where, you know, his Air Force contract, like that's a no brainer for the Air Force, right? Real time data from space uh, at that cost. It's incredible. And then you pass that on to the commercial realm. And if Dan is competitive with the placing of other sensors, or sorry, other ground stations. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got a monopoly. It's the coolest thing in the entire world, and it's all through innovation. Great. Um, we've covered the questions that I had wanted to ask. Is there anything else any of you would like to say? Uh, sure. Good gracious, and the other threes are wor- are worried now. They'll all over turn my mic off. Um, uh, we have the best um, um, technologists. We have the best um, mindset with respect to innovation. We've got um, we've got enormous uh, demand. Um, we've got an economy that is is adaptive to you know new ideas on transportation or communication and and and, and you know how we connect with one another um, and when and again i talked about our current situation as being you know the result of systemic failure um, the world needs those things more than ever and i appreciate the reality of the it, well you know tremendously fortunate to not be suffering the, the way many are now medically, financially, emotionally around our planet, in our neighborhoods, et cetera. And, and I appreciate the reality of that, of those traumas they're having and will have, and they'll be real. I would also point out though, that to me, it accentuates the need for us, this group, I'll say, to get it right. And, and the world has never demanded more awareness, information, decision quality, uh, timelines um, than now. And so, yeah, we, we will come out. And by the way, I'm, uh, I need help here. I don't like new normal because it sounds too normal. 
I don't know what to call the other side, but it's got to be something more different. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in the other side or on the other side, everything that this call has just been talking about is not just going to be part of the recovery and it's going to be part of the fabric of a new level of insight and action and thus health and well-being and financial security and all of those things. So horrible crisis to go through. Uh, Dan already said the mother of in invention is, is necessity. Nobody would want this, but but shame on us if we don't learn those lessons properly and, and apply them both you know, civically to our neighbor, commercially to our economies, and then globally to our combined security. To build on that a little bit, I think we have a huge role to play, not only in helping to recover from this systemic failure, but I think also to do what we can to prevent the next one, right? Thinking about how, how can we add that layer of transparency to the world through having this unique viewpoint from, from space that allows us to not drop the ball in a similar way on climate change, right? How do we ensure that we get efficient utilization of our single planet in a way that's sustainable? Or how do we ensure that we have enough transparency that we can trust our neighbors in this heightened situation coming out of, in, in the middle of this pandemic, right? If we can add information to that, right? More information only helps us have the tools at hand to make smart decisions as we start to face not only this challenge, but the challenges that are maybe exacerbated or made more difficult because of this systemic failure and just people not being able to cooperate as much or not trusting each other. I think we can add that layer of transparency and, and trusted verification in a world where there's not as much trust. So I, I think we have a huge role to play and a big responsibility as an industry to try to move as quickly as we can to get to that state, to equip ourselves with the tools that we really need to solve some of these, these looming grand challenges. You know, I hope that that plays out as true and it goes forward. That um, It reminds me of Walter always talked about setting up the company because way back when there was um, Russia and the US checking on each other on nuclear and missile options. And the belief was if there was a commercial capability, there would be more transparency and therefore less danger in something bad happening, or at least under, truly understanding what was going on on the other side instead of hypothesizing. And so hopefully it will bear out as we go forward a little more so perhaps than, than it has in the past. And I read an article, I think it was in Space News, and you might have wrote it, Deborah, and it was about uh, an increased demand of these products during this time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that more than anything, we have to come out of this pandemic having learned a lot. And, and I think that that's, that's the biggest takeaway we should take from this. And opening things up like that uh, commerce has done is a really huge leap towards that. But while I have Robert, I want to, I want to ask him, you know, what do you think about the adoption of, so like, obviously the air force has really moved forward with a lot of startups, um, given them contracts, made it easier for them to become, you know, get sole source contracts. Um, how do you see the other agencies, well, the IC adopting that? Because the military has been adopting it, you know, pretty quickly. Like, you know, it was, I would say it is very easy for us to work with them. Um, so the IC is um, being true to form. <laughs> no, no, no. There's, there's reason for that. They're being more careful. You know, and, and, and again, it's not crazy. You don't want the IC making a big mistake. You want them making little mistakes. So, so they'll take a baby step and they'll try something and we'll pilot something and et cetera. Um, I will tell you though, that I think that the, the DOD lead is fine. Not fine. It's good. Um, and it will help the IC gain kind of the confidence that it's safe to use uh, an OTA and a SIBR and a, and a, and a test vehicle and whatnot. Um, um, 
let's not kid ourselves. There will be resistance to that. There always is, right? There's the haves that will say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, <laughs> go slow there. Um, because uh, that's a that's a threat to my profit margin, you know, and, you know, and look, it's America. So let those games play on. But what I love about what people like Will Roper and Hondo Gertz are showing is, is that you can do this smartly. Uh, you can take these steps in a way that can be mutually beneficial. Um, I think you're going to see, Gabe, uh, that carry over uh, uh, to the IC. It just kind of naturally trails because of the nature of the business. I mean, I will say from, maybe it's because we're pretty close to launch, but I will say from, like, you know, last year, like, you know, they're coming. Like, they, they're they coming, like, to the facility. They're checking things out. They're kicking the tires way more so than I have seen in the last few years. Maybe it's because we're more real, or maybe because we actually went out and told people what we were doing. But... um there's been really yeah that probably helped it's <laughs> <laughs> but i mean we but here's the other thing when we started the company david's like david our ceo said there is no way we're going to get a license for it there's no way and so that is that was a big part of why we were so quiet and when we received our NOAA license we like you know let some information out there but now I'm like, yeah, I think we might be releasing a lot more information. I mean, Marcy talked about geolocation. Like, I, I mean, I can't imagine having a conversation about geolocation or RF mapping two years ago in a forum like this. So, and you look at Hawkeye. Hawkeye is such a great example of a company that's like, we're doing this. You want to regulate us? Let us know. And then, they were like, well, what is a remote sensing? Like, how do we, is that a remote sensing? And then they kind of stumbled and stumbled and then Hawkeye like launches a satellite and how they launched a whole bunch more. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's been a really fun area to be in. And I, th there has never been a better time for space and geo -in. Great. Well, on that note, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a pleasure talking to you and I look forward to speaking with you again. All right, we're going to start the uh, Q&A session of our uh, panel here. I'm Adam Simmons of Project Geospatial. Uh, we got a couple questions coming in from the audience here uh, as they were able to watch this video. Are there privacy concerns or issues uh, with real-time ISR? And uh, I wanted to filter this one out, but I think in in, in a certain way, this actually has uh, some value in answering uh, with how traditional ISR or traditional imagery has been taken uh, with such persistent imagery uh, from an hourly by hourly basis in the next couple of years, what can we be, can, can we, what can we be expecting uh, from privacy or, or, or is there even any concern at all? And I kind of want to present that to the group, whoever wants to answer that one. I'll go first. The uh, short, the shortest answer is yes. Um, but I'll, I'll add a few things and see what others think. I mean, to me, it's, it's somewhat built into any advanced capability. Um, uh, you can always turn around that capability and think about ways that it could be used either against you or create insecurity or invasion of privacy, et cetera. And I think that increased sensing of the planet, in this case, we're talking in the optical and radar range, of course, could uh, do that. But I think, I think there are many lessons to be learned from uh, positive and negative from these phones we carry around with ourselves that uh, you know have capabilities and most of them advance uh, humanity in many ways and some have to be monitored so um, but it, it definitely needs to be a conversation needs to be an open debate and all parties need to be invited There was, uh, there's obviously a history of a lot of folks asking about privacy concerns along the way. And I think maybe it's helpful for some folks to understand right now that there's not an exact, cap there's no capability to do 
facial recognition from space right now on the commercial scale. And, and although that may change as we go forward, but hopefully folks will adapt and we're not, you know, reading license plates like Mission Impossible and those kinds of things. So, um, so obviously th there will be change detection that's possible. And if you've put a pool in your backyard, it will be noticed and those kinds of things. But other than, than that, it's not an immediate personal infringement on what you yourself are doing. At least from my perspective, the company didn't know who lived there. It wasn't ever associated with, with an actual person. It was in general, this is what's happening as opposed to personal identification along with the information. Yeah, I think I'd add to that. It'll be interesting to see what technical solutions we can come up with that help hide some of that personal data. You, you could imagine that there are products that the, the end user never sees the actual image. They just get put through an algorithm that spits out an answer to a specific question and hides all of that more detailed information. So, so I think there are solutions there to help reduce privacy concerns. But as, as Robert mentioned, it can always be used in a, a negative way as, as any tool could that we, we develop. Um, but I think it will be that, that conversation across all the different parties to find ways to solve for those concerns um, in ways that, that make people feel comfortable that they're not being spied on from space. You know, I, I love this question because it is, um, it's something we, we have to think about every day. There's, you know, we carry around in our pocket a, a device, which if you accept the terms on some apps, you're telling people exactly where you're going, but it is, like Marcy said, it is not identified with a individual um, when when you're collecting imagery from space. But the the reality is, if we have a exquisite capability and keep it in the United States, it's better we have it and we can control and regulate it than having it freely amongst our enemies. Now that makes sense. I appreciate the, the answers from all of you. Uh, the next question I hear is, uh, how can individuals in the field play a role in cultural transition? And this is coming from uh, the workforce. In the presentation, you mentioned cultural transition. A few of you did. And, and what does it mean for the workforce, not just in commercially, but perhaps even the government analysts to adapt to uh, the, this this persistent IR, uh, I'm sorry, persistent ISR that's that's coming. Uh, especially since things might not be tasked no longer, as it's just being collected, right? Um, again, I'll do a quick top line because I um, I did mention culture and the challenges that exist at organizations like NGA with respect to. Uh, adapting to the new uh, capabilities of commercial um, innovation. And I will say this is a very, very small silver lining, very, very small from COVID because um, it, it has necessitated most of the workforce to go home and work. And you just couldn't have done that. I mean, I did it on a very small scale and we, you know, had pilots, et cetera. But I think broadly in a good way, the workforce that wasn't quite sure or didn't think, you know, it was worthwhile will come back to work with a different sense. So I hope it increases the demand signal on the other side, um, more out of, hey, look at what I can do with this versus the, oh my goodness, the, the code's coming to take my job which is, does sit in some folks' minds. So I, 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 think, I think we can come out the other side in a better way vis-a-vis -vis culture. Anybody else want to take that one on? It, it's probably been touched on already, but if even if the first question that gets asked is not, could something bad be done with this information, but rather something of how do we either mitigate the potential of a bad guy doing something with this information or just understanding that 
the world's going in that direction. So we're going to have to either accept it or figure out a different way to do what we want to do. Just just looking at it from a different perspective would be helpful. And I, I, obviously, I don't I don't want to um, throw out the question of what national security implications do we have, but it would be good to look at it from um, a variety of perspectives as opposed to just one. Well, thanks. Hey, we have two more questions here on the side. Uh, is uh, how do you think commercial and remote sensing, commercial and remote sensing industry, will be impacted in the long term ways by the pandemic overall? Uh, do you think that uh, there'll be a higher demand for it? And I know that's an, that's an odd add on, but that's uh, that that once again that was that was the second question that came in uh, that overlapped with with that one. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, I, so COVID is bad, but I would say that for commercial remote sensing, um, it has increased the demand where you have a lot of people who can't necessarily get access to the entire architecture of satellites. And maybe they want, they, they just need an image. So it's slap down a credit card and grab a commercial image of that thing you're looking at. And further, you're going to have a lot more people, um, a lot less travel where people are doing Zoom calls and whatnot and they're, they're realizing they don't need to do it. So things like site visits and that sort of thing, if you can just, you know, rip a picture for a few hundred bucks from space rather than flying out to see if some factory is on in China, I think that's pretty neat. Yeah. I would venture to say that COVID will shine a light on um, what commercial imagery can do, therefore increasing the request for it and how it can help the benefits that come from it as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of, a lot of companies will reflect after this. And now that this is, has happened and it's, seems like a it's a very true reality and not something that's more theoretical that a pandemic could happen. I think it should spur a lot of groups to start thinking about how do we make ourselves more resilient for next time, right? How do we start moving things to a system where it doesn't require somebody to be out in the field as, as Gay was mentioning and, and start to do some of these tests, right? It, it definitely lowers the barrier for them to start thinking about new approaches. Um, and then I think another long-term effect that it will be interesting to see how it plays out is, is how does this affect geopolitics, right? If, if there's less trust in the world in general, right, and less kind of communication flowing uh, between countries, and we want to understand, and we don't have the ability to physically go there to see what's going on on the ground, then this becomes an alternative to try to get you at least some information. And so I think in a, in a heightened geopolitical tension environment that 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 increases the demand for these type of capabilities awesome great responses and we have one more la one more question from the group here uh that that is watching noah's recent policy change was groundbreaking what policy changes do you hope get made that help the marketplace in the next couple of years anybody <laughs> Gabe, you seem to have some opinions about this uh, before the session. So, I mean, yeah, well, that's the thing. It's that everyone has, has the most opinions. The cameras are off. So, uh, you know, our, we have a very capable satellite and we are limited by the, still, even though the, the regulations have been very good for us. And yes, we can sell the highest, you know, resolution image out of the United States it's still not our best quality. And I think that removing regulations and letting America kind of have a, a head start is probably a good thing because we don't wanna, the way the regulations have been written is we have to wait for somebody to achieve something overseas before we can do it in the United States. I think America in technology has always led the charge and there's no reason why it shouldn't be done in commercial remote sensing. And I didn't even swear. <laughs> I'll add kind of from a different approach on the, 
it almost flips the question backwards, but I think that we have the potential to solve some regulatory challenges right, with new approaches. If you think about the FCC side, um, in remote sensing, everybody's using the same part of the spectrum to try to push their imagery to the ground. And right now it's sliced by, here's your part of the spectrum, here's the location that you have authorization to transmit over, but it's not really sliced by time. It's not that somebody can come at 2 a.m. in that same frequency, then somebody comes at 3 a.m. And, and it's dynamically allocated like that. If you had better communication into those satellites, you could dynamically allocate the frequency. And if they had that ability on their satellite to do a software defined radio that could jump between different frequencies, then you could get a whole lot more out of that fixed amount of spectrum if you had that ability to coordinate on that level. And so it's almost like it's regulated today. There's a friction there in trying to get authorization, but technology and innovative approaches have the ability to solve that regulatory coordination challenge and make it a challenge no longer. And so it's, it's almost instead of having the regulators try to figure out how to make it easier for us, I think there's a potential for us to resolve some of the challenges that they face through new approaches. So I hope both of those things happen in parallel because I think it's both of those things are good for the industry as a whole. I think it'll be interesting to see how those that are doing the licensing within the government interpret and then apply these new regulations to the li to the licenses. And, and so we'll go from there for one thing. And then I agree that it, it absolutely should be allowing the U S to lead and, and hopefully um, continue to be a, a global leader, but not, not just really being a global leader, but really taking taking over. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say, because um, as one who spent, oh, you know, three and a half decades on the government side of this question and leaning towards um, careful uh, risk assessments, right? You know, that's it's too risky if this or that is exposed or, or, you know, some U.S. operation might be able to be sensed if we allow this or that. Um, I think the reality is, is that the world is just becoming more and more sensed. And, uh, you know, Gabe, I've already mentioned, we've, we've given it up in the, in the signals arena. We're all just carrying around these things with blue dots and, and all that. And I think we're moving towards that in this spectrum. And I, for one, think it's a good thing. Um, I think democracies function well in the light. And I think the more that we can bring that light to bear, the more our institutions, our values will come forward. Now, again, that's not always the central question in the government meeting, you know, about can we move this or move that? But I do think we're heading to eventually, we should regulate the end use, you know, not the, not the technology. And you can always, you know, deal with implications. But I, again, I just, I'll, I'll stick with transparency is a good thing and, and, the more regulation moves to that, I think it, I think it's to the U.S. advantage. Awesome. Great. And that wraps up our questions uh, for this session. I'm um, glad we don't have any more because it's turning into a whole different kind of panel. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you for everybody for popping on for Q&A with the real-time ISR panel. Uh, this has been a session hosted by Project Geospatial in partnership with the American Geographical Society with the Geospatial Frontier Virtual Technology Fair. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, be sure to listen in throughout the month of June. Plenty more to come this month. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Ciao, ciao.